How are we going, guys, in terms of uh, being able to start? Ready to go? Great. Okay, so um, so welcome to the Warren Lecture for 2020. My name is Gerald Fogarty. I'm the current master of the college, the fourth master uh, of the college. And uh, welcome to those who are present today physically and uh, also to those who can only attend virtually because of the continuing restrictions due to the pandemic. I apologise for that inconvenience and wish you were here with us in person. I would now like to show my respects and acknowledge the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land where Warane College is located. I'd also like to show my respects and acknowledge those who have made Warane College possible and continue to make the college possible, both living and deceased. And I would like to show my gratitude to God who has given us this wonderful country, this time and this college to share and to ask his help so that his will, be done, his will will be done during our stewardship of the college. Welcome also to those who have attended before, residents, former residents and friends of the college. Welcome. I particularly welcome the College Council, which was established as a way to focus more specifically on the development of, the, of this college into this exciting 21st century. One pleasant duty that we have is organising an appropriate celebration of the 50th anniversary of the opening of this building, which falls on the 13th of June 2021. Thanks all for your continuing support of that. Well, it's our pleasure once again to have the annual lecture. We think the lecture is an important part of what makes us a college, educating future generations and adding to the intellectual and cultural development of our nation. Just to bring you up to speed with the college, this is the 49th year of the college's existence in this building. Of course, the college is not just a building, but the residents who live here. And we'd like to think of it as a family rather than just a community. Many of the current residents have a family member that, were either, that was either a father or a brother who are Warren alumni. And this adds certainly to our sense of family over the generations here at Warren. This COVID year has been challenging for all. However, our fellows have managed to get the job done. The overall college weighted average mark in terms one and two was above 75% that is above a, a distinction average. So here are young men doing well. We've been able to complete many of our usual traditions with the leadership of our tutors and activities committee to which I am very grateful. These events include our Wednesday formal dinners, Iron Chef, cocktails under the stars, and uh, we wait the college ball this Friday at Le Montage, unfortunately without the dancing, uh, which will be completed all with COVID safety requirements in place. Thanks again for your support. Thanks for, for either attending or, or tuning in tonight. And for those physically present, please join us for supper afterwards. I'm now going to hand over to Tony Shannon, who's going to introduce our guest for us tonight. Thank you, Tony. Good evening and welcome. I'd like First of all, to welcome members of the College Council who are here, honorary and academic fellows of the College, Professor Bill Pearson, the Master of New College, and I acknowledge many people following the address on, with live stream. As Gerald mentioned, the Warane Lecture is the highlight of the College's academic program. It's delivered each year by a person eminent in public or professional life. The aim of the lecture is to contribute to the understanding of important issues and important challenges which are facing society. Nyungai Warren Mundine is an officer of the Order of Australia, honorary doctor of Southern Cross University, is a writer, media commentator, event speaker, a highly respected and influential businessman, political strategist, and advocate for Australian economic reform and growth, particularly empowering the First Nations of Australia to build businesses and sustainable economies. I better not go on too long, I'll be speaking longer than Warren. But even summarising his career takes quite a while. His life and career have been shaped by a personal commitment to regional and indigenous economic development. He has over 40 years experience working in the public, business, policy, arts and community sectors. 
Warren's topic tonight summarises his public life's aim of advanced Australia fair towards a prosperous nation for all. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Warren Mundine. Thanks for that um, introduction. I'm always interested in what people say about me, especially as my mother writes it, so it's good. He missed out in the, missed out in the last sentence, which was, and he was a perfect child. But anyway. <laughs> uh, Ginger Walla. I wish to also acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders and traditional owners of this land that we're holding the 2020 Waran Lecture, which I think is Pretty good name, actually, Warren Lecture. A couple of words changes and it could be the Warren Lecture. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to just talk about uh, are several things tonight. One is I'm just going to give a, a very basic uh, understanding of how the Commonwealth of Australia and Federation operates here, which has been very highlighted through the uh, COVID-19. But it, sh but it highlighted how, as a country, we operate and what sort of reforms and things that need to be done to actually get us moving and, and, and get through the COVID-19, but also how we come out the other side and deal with a very rapidly changing world. I'd also w will be talking about, of course, I'd be very amiss to talk about some of the political uh, and confronting things that we're having at the moment, as well as what I see moving forward for our, our prosperity, prosperity as a nation. Because there is a few things that we, uh, people don't quite understand about us is that we, we do punch above our weight. We actually do quite well in the world. In fact, we're one of the world's top economies, which when you think about all these other countries in the world who are so much larger than us and seem to be, you think, so, so much richer than us, you'll be surprised how far up that economic ladder that we are. Anyway, people tend to forget and don't understand uh, that Australia, like Canada and the United States of America, is a federation. The former colonies of New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and Western Australia coming together the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901. At one point, New Zealand was going to join us, but decided they could beat us up at rugby. <laughs> what, me what that means is there are seven really sovereign states, the Commonwealth and each of the states. The territories, Australia, Australian Capital Territories and the Northern Territory are not sovereign states. They are Commonwealth territories that have been set up by Commonwealth legislation, and these are very important differences. There is a division of power and who is in charge of what. For example, law and order, education, health, land management are under state control. Defence, international relationships and trade are under Commonwealth control. I learnt this being involved in Indigenous affairs. The Commonwealth, until the 1967 referendum, couldn't make laws about Aboriginals except in the Commonwealth territories. And and the states had a complete control of it. And during the time of COVID-19, it has really highlighted the different powers under this constitution. Who would have believed that the states would actually close their borders and tell the federal government to bugger off, quite frankly. I'm a proud Australian, an Aboriginal Australian of Bundjalung, Gumbanga, Ewan and Irish descent. The Irish in there explains my drink drinking habits as well as being brought up a Catholic in those cultures of my descent. And my family sees itself as and proud of all these cultures and faiths. Australia has races just like other nations and communities in the world. Yes, you even may be surprised that Aboriginals can be racist as well. And after watching Star Trek and Star Wars and Stargate SG-1, I can assume that even species all over the universe could have racists in their communities as well. But Australia is not a racist country. I know what racism is. <coughs> I lived and experienced it. The first 13 years of my life, I lived under the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Act. 
it, it regulated just about all aspects of Aboriginal lives. That was legislative racism. In Aus and in Australia, there have been no re legislative racism since the early 70s at the latest, and in New South Wales particular since 1969 when all those laws were abolished. Now, one of the things I'd like to talk about now is in regard to busting some myths. And I'll talk about in regard to the, to the uh, referendum of 67. There's a lot of myths about that. And one of them was that Aboriginals were given the right to vote. In actual fact, that wasn't the case. New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania, when their colonial constitutions were framed, mostly in the 1850s, for example, New South Wales, 1858, Victoria, 1857, South Australia, 1858, and Tasmania in 1896, voting rights were granted to all male British subjects over the age of 21. It was acknowledged that Aboriginals were British subjects under the English common law and were entitled to, to the rights of that status. Accordingly, Aboriginal men were not specifically denied the right to vote. However, few Aboriginals were aware, weren't, were aware, weren't aware of their rights. Aboriginals were not encouraged to enrol to vote and very few partic participated in elections, but they had the right to vote. Some Aboriginal people are known to have voted. For example, Port Maclay, a mission station near the mouth of the Murray River in South Australia, got a polling station in the 1890s. And Aboriginal men and women voted there in South Australia. Yes, in South Australia, they were here. They had, women had the right to vote a long time before anyone else. The South Australian elections. My grandfather was enrolled around 1915 in New South Wales, and a polling booth existed in Bayugal, which is the Aboriginal square there, in, up the Clarence Valley in northern New South Wales, where my fa father's family lived. Queensland. You can see why people think of Queensland as the deep north. Queensland gained self-government in 1859, extending voting rights in 1872 to include all British male subjects over the age of 21. But Aboriginals were excluded from voting in Queensland in 1885, and the disqualification was in place until 1965. Western Australia gained self-government in 1890. In 1893, voting rights were extended to include all British male subjects over the age of 21, with the exclusion of Aboriginal males. Aboriginals were disqualified for the vote in Western Australia until 1962. The Commonwealth, and this is one of the interesting things under the section of the Constitution, Section 41 of the Australian Constitution gave the right to vote in federal elections to those who had the right to vote in state elections. So New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia, Aboriginal people could vote in the Commonwealth elections. In fact, there are records of Aboriginals voting in 1901 and beyond uh, because they had the right to vote. The Commonwealth Franchise Act 1902 reinforced Section 41 and made it clear if you had the right to vote in a state election, you had the right to vote in Commonwealth elections. The Act, which is a bit of a funny thing to the Act, the Act also denied the vote to native people of Asia, Africa and the Pacific Islanders, except New Zealanders. So we had the strange positions that Aboriginals had the right to vote, but not people of Asia, African and Pacific Islander descent, except New Zealanders. In 1924, the Victorian District Court there was a case brought by a person of Indian descent who was a registered voter in Victoria. The court upheld Section 41, finding that if you were registered in state elections, you could vote in Commonwealth polls. This included Aboriginals in all states except Queensland and Western Australia. And it wasn't until the 1949 Commonwealth Electoral Act, which reinforced that and gave the Commonwealth vote to Aboriginals also, but also Aboriginals who were in Queensland and Western Australia who served in the military. And then this all changed in 1962. The Menzies government amended the Commonwealth Electoral Act to give Aboriginals the right to enrol and vote in Commonwealth elections irrespective of their voting rights in the state level. 
if they were enrolled, it was compulsory for them to enroll as, non, as, non -Aboriginal, as much as non-Aboriginal citizens. Western Australia gave Aboriginal, the vote, Aboriginal citizens the, the vote in the state elections in the same year, 1962, and Queensland followed in 1965. And to clear all matters up, in the 1983 Electoral Act was amended to remove all discriminatory comments and any and removing any differentiations or distinctions based on race in the Australian electoral system. Oh, it may surprise you, you're looking at me on stage, he's thinking he's a young, good-looking man. Uh, but I actually first enrolled in 1974 uh, because of my parents' insistence. The 1967 referendum did not give Aboriginal Australians voting rights. We had them already. In fact, the vast majority of us had those rights well prior. It was only Queensland and uh, Western Australia that held out to the early 60s. Now, I'm always about a bit of truth talking. So that was a bit of truth talking about Aboriginals having the vote to write, and we've always had that right to vote in New South Wales. Is some of the things that are talked about people, and I said like after the uh, horrific killing of George Floyd by Minnesota, uh, Mini, yeah, Mini, Minneapolis police, Minnesota's a state, Minneapolis police in the USA, Australian activists marched in solidarity with American activists and took opportunities to highlight Indigenous deaths in custody. Protesters call for truth talking. So let's talk of some truths, all of them. Truth number one, there have been some appalling deaths of Aboriginals at the hands of police in corrective services offices intentionally for sheer recklessness and incompetence or shrouded in suspicions. I've protested and advocated on these matters myself. Some terrible examples are the death of John Pat in Roeburn, Eddie Murray in Western New South Wales, Miss Dow in Western, uh, Western Australia, Mr Dumaji, who's deaf in in our Palm Island police station with a ruptured liver and spleen and Mr Ward cooked to death, left in a prison van for four hours with temperatures reaching 56 degrees. F convictions for killers by police have always historically proven difficult, both in Australia and the United States and including for white victims as well, generating immense anger and frustration. George Floyd's death, too, was dreadful, and I've yet to hear anyone of any political persuasion say otherwise. Truth number two, Aboriginals represent 17% of deaths in custody, despite only being 3% of the Australian population. But I think that's the wrong statistic to look at, because Aboriginals also make up over 27% of all prisoners. 17% of deaths, 27% of all prisoners. 83% of deaths in custody are non-Aboriginal and 73% of all prisoners are non-Aboriginal. So Aboriginals are less likely to die in custody than non-Aboriginals. This is in part due to the actions taken to prevent Indigenous deaths in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission. So this myth is of more deaths by Aboriginals is not true. Truth number three, protesters quote 434 Indigenous deaths in custody since the Royal Commission. There are deaths for, for any reason. These are deaths for any reason. If a prisoner dies from suicide, heart attack or cancer or is killed by another prisoner or if someone drowns while escaping police, it's counted as a death in custody. As noted by the Royal Commission, Aboriginals are more likely to die in custody because they're more likely to be in custody. And higher incarceration rates largely come down to two things, violence and reoffending. More than 57% of Indigenous prisoners are incarcerated for violent offences and Aboriginals make up 18% of those incarcerated for homicides and sexual assault. Indigenous suicide rates also double the non-Indigenous rates. Truth number four, Aboriginals are, more, are also 
disproportionately victims of homicide and violent offences. There were 951 Indigenous homicide victims, 13% of all victims, between the 1st of July 1989 to the 30th of June 2012. So if you include the extra eight years for that, that's going to be well over probably about 2,000, two uh, not 2,000, uh, 1,350 people. A Western Australian report found Aboriginal mothers in Western Australia were 17 and a half times more likely to be murdered. Aboriginal women 34 times more likely to be hospitalised from domestic violence. And yet Black Lives Matters protesters did not march for these lives. All this can't simply be blamed on colonisation, segregation and racism. Indigenous incarceration rates have nearly doubled since 1991. Suicide rates become, began escalating in the late 1980s. After civil rights were won, after the 67 referendum, after land rights and a Mabo decision, while the treatment of Indigenous Australians have vastly improved. So where did this come from, this rise? It stems from chronic intergenerational welfare dependence, social breakdown stemming from the mass transfer, transition of Aboriginals from work to welfare since the 1970s, and we won't see change unless Indigenous kids go to school, Aboriginals are working in real jobs, and there are real economies in Indigenous communities. Which brings me to Australia's economy, prosperity, and closing the gap. I do not know any race of people who have pulled themselves out of poverty and built a prosperous society without an economy. As the Prime Minister would say, jobs, jobs, jobs. I would add education and investment. Com commerce and private enterprise are essential to economic development and genuine self-sufficiency. Indigenous communities will no not move from poverty to prosperity until the conditions necessary for private enterprise and commerce to thrive exist in these communities. A gap exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, but increasingly a gap is developing between remote and urban Indigenous communities. These gaps can be closed, can be closed without the need of, for indefinite handouts, but through the normal progression to full commercial participation. Unlocking Indigenous communities to real and sustainable development and bringing all Indigenous people into the full participation in commerce, in commerce will benefit the all entire economy of Australia. You can imagine there's about $30 billion worth of welfare payments annually going into Aboriginal communities if you could remove them from the welfare sector into economic development businesses and jobs, education, then you remove that huge amount of, of dollars that are pouring in there. Now, I come up with a sort of seven-point reform agenda, which is, the, I say, jobs, creation of real jobs as a result of commercial activities with Indigenous people being trained and job-ready and on, onboarded to a specific job at the end of their training. Regulatory reform, remove the barriers to private asset ownership and commerce to create an environment for commercial and economic growth. It may surprise you that Aboriginals can't own homes on their own land it's through native title and land rights. Private ownership, the economies of Indigenous communities are driven by private enterprise and private asset ownership. Indigenous people participating fully in Australia's free market commercial system for real jobs in the non-government sector and through commercial activities. Investment, create an environment that will enable and foster investment and flow of capital in Indigenous communities. And one of these things is looking at some of what they're doing in the United States with Opportunity Zones, which has worked really well for the Latino and uh, African American communities. Infrastructure, investment in, in social and physical infrastructure with Indigenous communities, including by the community members itself. Sustainability, economic sustainability, build structures and systems that will endure, enabling communities to thrive for the long term without disproportionate reliance on government or other external support. Desegregation, Engage, engagement by Aboriginal people and communities in the mainstream Australian and global economy. 
What the closing the gap needs is the economic oomph factor. The 2020 closing the gap presented to the Commonwealth Parliament in February this year, and yet again it shows the failings in closing the gap. Yes, there was some good news, but most of it was bad. The Morrison government have realised that the closing the gap uh, program needs a good look at, and it needs to change as to get the program back on track. I congratulate the Morrison government for the review, and here I'm going to give my two bobs worth on what needs to be done. We need to get the old mundane economic term, the oomph factor, a bit of disruption into the closing the gap. I'm a great fan of disruption. It's something, you know, if you're not happy with the situation as it is, well, just smash it and disrupt it. First of all, we need to clothe the program in an economic program. I don't know any society in history, as I said before, that pulled themselves out of poverty and built a healthy, educated, housed, infrastructured society without an economy. You only have to look at the high wealth and low poverty, high employment, housed, educated and healthy countries in the world and it becomes that it's because of strong economies. The current closing the gap model has too many targets and the targets are too low. The current targets are only 50% parity to the rest of Australia. We need to focus on, on reaching 100% not 50%. Let's wrap the, the Closing the Gap program in an economic program with two main targets, jobs and education, moving hand in hand to meet a target of 100% parity with the rest of Australia at a regional, because it is each region is different to each other, state and territory and at the national level within 10 years. Treat it as, a, as an, an Aboriginal Australian Marshall Plan with Aboriginal Australian leadership front and centre. It doesn't take rocket science to work out that housing goes with jobs, Aboriginal Australians learning skills, trades, town planning, infrastructure, investment, building ownerships to build their houses and their towns. This leads on to retail, shops, repair, maintenance, upgrades, services, schools, health clinics, transportation and businesses. This is just one example. Another is land rights and native title. Currently, Aboriginal Australians own 20%, probably up, moving up to 25% of Australia's land mass, as well as sea with mining, agriculture, fisheries, natural and cultural resources on that land and sea. Currently, more than $4 billion goes into Indigenous hands just from the mining and resources industry alone. The current federal budget for direct funding of Aboriginals is $4 billion. So the mining industry alone is getting more money into Aboriginal communities than what the Australian government is. With these dollars plus the Commonwealth state, territories and local government funds and the private commercial sector investment, the opportunities are there for a massive turnaround in Aboriginal Australia and Australia as a whole. The other main target of education is key. To have a successful economy, you need a skilled and educated workforce. We need to get at the adults into jobs, training and education programs and off welfare, and we need to get their children to school and educated, and we need to start at both ends, at the adult and children end at the same time. This will mean targeting women's health, pre and postnatal, children's preschool and primary education to build healthy and educated mothers and healthy children, with the Education Foundation to help them throughout their life and careers. Let's use the resources we now have for cooperation between different sectors of, of, Aboriginal, of uh, Aboriginal Australians, governments, industry and society as a whole, as well as technology. Technology is our friend and can make a huge difference. The first step is the revamp of the Closing the Gap program and targets instigating an Aboriginal uh, Australian uh, Marshall Plan, or dare I say it, the, I think it's a very sexy name actually, the Mundine Plan, and making it central. Acknowledge the past, commit to not making the same wrongs again, and move on from the blame game and focus on the here and now and moving forward. We have a great country here in Australia. You'd be hard pressed to find a better country in the world. Let's, to, let's commit to making it greater. And I'll leave it there and I'll open it up to questions and answers and, and if there's any shyness about you think your question's stupid, uh, don't worry, 
We'll tell you that if it is. And um, don't be bashful and ask me anything. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. We'll have a formal vote of thanks later. So the questions are obviously going to come from the floor, but also the Dean, Arthur S. Camilla, will send me questions from YouTube via WhatsApp. I'm not sure what all that means, <laughs> but it's to be fair. So are there questions for Warren? Bill. Correct. Uh, and that's why I said there was a, the, the difference between cities and reg, region and rural and remote com communities. They all have that different challenges. So that's why we must be, uh, look at it as more of a regional approach and not treat people the same across Australia. So we need to do that. The, <clears throat> the good news for us is, uh, but it is a challenge, is the, the focus of the, uh, the government now about uh, regional and rural Australia. Uh, oh, uh, you, you all know about the famous map of, of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, South Korea, the lights are all on. North Korea, the lights, there's no lights. I, I put up a map at a conference once in the, of Australia and you see all the lights sort of down this sliver of the east coast and a bit of lights in Western Australia and maybe one or two lights somewhere else. The rest of the country is in darkness. Uh, in Australia, it only takes two or three cities uh, and you've got half the population of Australia. In the United States, you have to go through 100 cities before you get half the population of the United States. So if we're really going to uh, confront the challenges of the ever-changing global world and plus COVID-19, uh, I use the old cliche, never let a crisis go by. And so... To do that, we have to focus on regional uh, Australia, rural and regional and remote Australia. If you look at remote Australia, you look at northern Australia, which they call remote, uh, there's hardly anyone that lives up there. And, uh, and, we, and it's, at, it's just only, you know, you could spit across the... I don't suggest you do because Indonesians are nice people. You could spit across to Indonesia virtually and yet we've got no one up there. It's about time we actually started focusing on that northern development. I know there's been money set aside and all this type of stuff, but nothing's really been done. That we, that we can engage with our friends and allies in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, that Southeast Asian area, because it is one of the fastest growing economic uh, areas of the globe. In fact, Indonesia, in 15 or 20 years, will, be, will have a, a massive economy. And uh, then Australia, they'll, they'll leap jump over us. So we, t for friendship, uh, because they're our neighbours, they're not going to move away, not like some of my neighbours, they, they need, we need to develop the infrastructure, uh, the populations and do it properly because we've got the technology and to do it and, the, and we can actually build a very strong northern Australia which then hip, you know, just skip and jump across to uh, Southeast Asia and, uh, and of course to India uh, as well and our northern Asian friends in Japan, South Korea and that. So we need to be fair to income about it. Stop setting committees up. Stop uh, funding billions of dollars into pet projects and actually just, you know, I use the old American saying which was go west young man, I say go north young man and develop those areas. Western New South Wales has got a huge amount of potential out there to be developed and built. It's same for Queensland, I've worked in Queensland and Western Queensland. It, you, you see these states and, that, and they're hardly doing anything. We need to be investing in our regional and remote areas and, and, and engaging with, North, with Southeast Asia, Central Asia 
and the north, as well as our Pacific countries to our east and north, uh, northeast. And there's great opportunities for the do, to do that. Now, with the changing um, global uh, uh, strategies that are happening around the world at the moment, it's very important for us to actually start looking about how we bring manufacturing back in Australia and build stuff here. I'm part of a company that uh, just won the Sydney contract for the Sydney buses. That's, uh, and, and how we're doing it, we're actually building our manufacturing and assembly plant in regional New South Wales. 2,000 jobs at, uh, of a town and we're investing a lot of money in that. It's over $700 million. So we need to be focusing on those type of things. This isn't government money. This is, this is investment money, and how we get to, to get more investments into our country, because we not like the United States, we've got a lot of money, we need to be, make that easier for people to invest in Australia, and we need to be working a lot closer with our uh, Asian friends and South Pacific friends, as well as uh, other areas in, in the globe. Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's a. Oh uh, yeah, I know. Uh, well, yeah. So what we, we're doing, we're doing EV vehicles. So it's uh, electric vehicles. Uh, uh, we've won this contract, so that our first hundred buses roll out in December. Uh, we're we're very shy people, like myself. Uh, keep it. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, so there's something like eight thousand buses to be built. And it's going to, and it's all going to be uh, electric vehicle buses for the Sydney, Newcastle, Wollongong area, and then from that, uh, we believe that uh, through proper infrastructure uh, development, uh, where you can pull up with the service station, get your diesel, get your gas, get your petrol, lead, unleaded petrol, and and then you get charge your vehicle, uh, uh, so you can have that choice. So that's going to be rolled out over the next couple of years, and then. Uh, uh, the, we believe the, the market will then take off if you have that family type cars. So, for instance, Tesla sort of like the Ferrari or the electric vehicles. That's fine if you've got a hundred and something thousand dollars. When you get down to thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars vehicles, that's when they'll, uh, the, the market will take off. Families will be able to buy it. They'll be able to drive the Dubbo uh, before they need to be recharged and then they can drive back. Yeah. And that technology is on our doorstep virtually now. So it's, and, it's, uh, and I, was a, I was a strong critic of the Labor Party at the last federal election where they looked at government to force people to do this and also to, to put a lot of government funding. Well, we're going to do this without government funding and we're doing it now. It's just a purely commercial marketplace driven Yes, sorry. I worked in the University of Notre Dame in Detroit, and we had a very strong um, Aboriginal um, looking after Aboriginal med students mm. in one of the main areas. And I know the Aboriginal um, person in charge of the curriculum there very well, Mr. Mm. Sandler. And she said to me today, actually, that I'm sick to death mm. of people approaching me because. You should watch my TV show. In May, you'll be and buy my books. I'll be even better. Uh, I have a, 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 I had a TV show on Sky and Win, and I've now gone on to uh, social media, putting it out there. It's called Mundine Means Business. Uh, what we do is interview Indigenous entrepreneurs, uh, people who run companies, something that are worth 
five million to six or seven hundred million dollars. These are Aboriginal people from remote areas, a lot of them. Uh, Tammy O'Connor, for instance, comes from Marble Bar in the middle of the desert and she ru runs this a huge waste management company. Uh, so, so, so what, what we have is, is uh, a lot of, uh, I think, uh, besides truth talking, I like to talk about truth talking, I like to also dispel myths. And, and we work on a very simple process. One is, uh, we, we like to show Aboriginal people who are doing things. You know, and they're running their businesses and they're talking like business people and they're making lots of money because you've got to be a commercial, profitable business to help your community if you're going to help them. You can't do it without money. And, uh, and, so, and, and also to, sh to dispel the myth that Aboriginals don't run businesses. In the last 10 years, 10 years? Yeah, 2010, there have been over tw 12... No, no, 2,000 Indigenous businesses created in that period of time uh, and, that's, and that's sort of the spill out of their money, uh, 5, 000, uh, 5 million to six, $700 million businesses. And, they, and that's been done because uh, of a deliberate approach that we did with the federal government, the previous Labor government in 2010, and, the, and the, we got the oomph factor out of the uh, coalition government from 2013 where we've focused on simple things uh, which has created the wealth of the world. And I may suggest a book to you. It was given to me by a good friend of mine who is a, a banker, so don't hold that against him. Uh, he, uh, he said, you've got to read this book, and it's called Why Nations Fail. And what it's about is about two, two and a half thousand years of history. They're done by two, uh, three economists, uh, one uh, from the... MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Harvard University. But they write in English. They don't write ac in economic jargon. And they actually explain why nations fail and why nations are succeeded. And it's, and it's, about, it's about how governments don't pick winners and losers, don't uh, uh, try and run uh, business, the private sector, and actually set the environment for things to happen. So they, so they did their research over China uh, uh, 2,500 years ago, starting with them, uh, India, uh, uh, Central and Western Africa, South America, uh, Central America, United States and Europe. So they looked over that 2,500 years thing. And it's actually a very simple formula, and which is the formula I use in business. You just do it. You get government to step back and create the incentives for things to happen. And, you're, and then you're able to make things uh, move along from there. So it's a really good book. Unfortunately, I don't get any royalties because I just plugged it. But it's, it is, if, you're, if you want to know how to run economies and how to... Um, uh, do things, and I reckon it's one of the best books I've ever read. Yeah. Very simple, very straightforward. Shows why nations fail, why nations succeed. It starts out in a town. I'm getting the word that will um, uh, starts in a, a town on the Mexican United States border. It's got a, a line straight through the middle of it, uh, and even though it's the same people, the same families, on one side of the border they're living in poverty, and the other side they're very wealthy. And it asks the question, why? And then it goes back through that historical approach to economics. Thanks. Just knock your clothes down. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Questions. I love questions. There are 33 people out there somewhere in the universe watching. And one of them is ask, asking... I hope it isn't from Stargate or something. You know. <laughs> How effective are activities such as those generated and supported by government entities like the Indigenous Land and Seas Corporation. Is this an economically efficient mechanism? Oh, that's a good question. The IBA, you can put IBA in the same uh, boat, Indigenous Business Australia. I'll, I'll say something very confident. Uh, um, not a, a, a bit disruptive. Uh, in the, there, there are organisations that were uh, set up for different reasons. The Indigenous Land and Sea Council was set up originally uh, to compensate 
uh, Indigenous people who didn't get native title. So we got this native title uh, in Western Australia where they got all these mining agreements, they become very wealthy communities. For the people who didn't have iron ore and gold and everything on their properties or their land, or they couldn't get native title because they live in the southeast where it's very difficult to get, then it was a, a compensation process of helping them to buy land and make it and to eventually make it profitable for them. Uh, so that was a different thing to what the Indigenous Business Australia was about. Indigenous Business Australia started out as lending money to help Aboriginals get into home ownership, and then it developed into a into a, uh, a development. It was eventually supposed to be a development bank. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't quite get to the development bank stage because it got caught up with all the regulatory problems we have with banking in Australia. And so if you were going to get a loan from them, it would have been the same, you could have got a loan from the Commonwealth Bank or Westpac or anywhere else. So, so they need to re restructure themselves if they're going to be a true development bank because true development banks take higher risk and work with uh, uh, small businesses and people who need a, a bit of a help along. Uh, uh, currently, at the moment, they don't do that. Uh, the ILSC started out to help Aboriginal people who couldn't get native title. It was a total disaster in the beginning. There was a lot of lots of failures, uh, lots of losses there. And then they ended up to becoming one of the biggest Australian landholders because they ended up with all these properties that went broke. And so, so look, as my mum says, she was a good Catholic woman. She, uh, she used to say, the road to hell is always paved with good intentions. And that's what I say about those two organisations. But they are, I've got to give it to them, they are looking at themselves, they are trying to reform themselves to, uh, to, to become the thing they should have been in the first place. Uh, what you get from, I haven't heard a, an Aboriginal person yet say they don't want to get education for their kids, okay? The problem with that is what is happening really on the ground. And the problem we have is, is this, I'll talk about school attendance stuff. Uh, there is a huge, and, th and this is the problem about federation, because the federal government can't do much in this area because education, school education, is a state thing. They run it. And I'll give you an example of what happened to us. When I was chair of the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council, we asked to say, OK, how do we... 100 kids live in, in, in X town. 50 kids turn up on, day, on Monday and 50 kids turn up on Tuesday. Are they the same kids? Because we know you have to ha a kid has to attend nearly 90% of the school Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Right? They just don't get the education that they need to have. Now, so, and the states couldn't answer that question. States and territories. And then places like New South Wales and Victoria and Queensland who had good information, they refused to tell us that. So how are we supposed to be funding programs for a school attendance if we not, don't know if the kids are at school attending school about 90% of the time? So that was a problem. It was a political problem. I'm hoping that Ken White can overcome that problem now because if we don't have that information about... And we don't need to know their names. We don't need to know the kids. Or they could be ex-kid one, ex-kid two or whatever. We do need to know if they're attending the school a certain amount of time, because otherwise if they're not, we cannot help them. We cannot get them that education that they need and work with the education departments for that to happen. That was, that was a major problem. Uh, getting figures on um, uh, s improvement. They got 50% of maths today. Did they get, what did they get at the next exam? Was it 50% or 6%? We, couldn't, we didn't know. We couldn't get that information. And this is, again, the problem of the Federation. Now, I spoke about the Federation in the beginning because I knew I was going to get some questions about it. States 
and territories run the schools. And so you've got to get that information. A good little trick the Northern Territory Government used to do was they'd get all the kids that enrol on day one, and because that's how the federal government funded them. They'd go, oh, oh you've got 100 kids, we'll give you $100 for argument's sake, a dollar a kid. The kids never come back day two, three or four or five, but they still got their money, the Territory Government, so they didn't care. Territory Government didn't care. They got their money and they've siphoned their money out through consolidated revenue to do other things. Now, that was one of the problems we had. So, so, so that was a massive struggle and a massive battle, and I think um, Ken's probably the good guy to do it. I hope he can break through that, that incredible... Uh, uh, barrier that the states and territories put in regard to education of Indigenous kids. Because Indigenous kids are citizens of that state and territory. They should be treated the same as every other kid. And that's the problem we're having. They're not. Well, that's where you've got to... It's, it's about how you do your pro, uh, procurement policies and so on. So w one of the interesting things, and this is one thing I learnt when I sat on the in National Indigenous Housing Commission, uh, we spent three point... No, no, it wasn't three. It was $6 billion on Indigenous remote housing. That's remote housing. That's not Dubbo's or Kalgoorlie's or, or Perth or Sydney. It's remote. Si $6 billion on that. So we thought it would be a good idea about how do we work with those Aboriginal communities to train people up to build those houses. And then you get a workforce. And then we talked to the mining industry because the mining industry was already doing this, training people to be carpenters, training people to be mechanics and electricians and all that type of stuff. So they could actually work together because they're working in remote communities about building this workforce. Uh, the problem with, with that is is the way the, uh, the procurement policy is operated. And, and when you get to uh, remote areas, uh, building op operates on a mate by mate. You're my mate, I'll look after you, you look after me. So you had all these big building companies who were uh, getting these contracts, but they weren't fulfilling that training and employment stuff. And this is why we look very much at the mining industry. And I'll give you a good example. In 2018, I emceed the FMG uh, Billion Idea Program. Now, what it was, Nev Power was CEO at the time, and uh, Andrew Forrest was the chairman. In 2011, they decided we need to, what are we doing for those communities about economic development business? So what they come up with, they call it the Billion Opportunities Program. In 2018, from 2011 to 2018, $1.2 billion went in salaries to those Aboriginal communities where they were trained, they were set up in what they call VTEC, Vocational Training Employment Centres, and they're sort of like we don't leave the Marines behind, yeah, the Marine thing, we don't leave anyone behind. So if, you, if we're going to get you in a job, you've got drug and alcohol problems, you've got domestic violence problems, uh, you've got, you've got uh, literacy and numeracy problems, you haven't got a car licence, uh, you, uh, you haven't got accommodation. That, well, they dealt with all those issues. They read them down and they ticked them off one by one. And so you were able to get through that course. And they said, if you get through that, this course, we're going to give you a job, guaranteed. And so the kids have got through that course, not only kids, adults, mature age. I knew a woman who was, uh, had, uh, she was in a domestic violence situation in Perth. She, uh, she got out of it and moved to, back to her home, uh, homelands her and her children, so she was a single mum, hadn't worked for more than 10 years. They put her in a VTEC program within 26 weeks. She, uh, they set her up in a nursery on one of the mine sites because they to deal with the dust issues and to make it more aesthetically pleasing. And she runs that nursery now. It's, it's a multi-million dollar nursery because she works on five or six mine sites now doing that type of work. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to put the hard yards in up front You've got to go in there and say, okay, you've got drug and alcohol problems, let's, let's work on that. If you've got domestic violence problems, how do we get you out of that situation? 
uh, you've got a licensing problem. This, this, how do we deal with your license? You, you haven't got a trade. How do we get a trade? You haven't got an education. How do we get an education for you? You've got a mental health issues. How do we work with your mental health issues? So it's, so it's a very simple concept. We don't leave anyone behind. It's, we deal with all those issues to get you back to a healthy lifestyle again, and you've got a job. Make this the last question yeah. because we're mixing in a socially distant environment with refreshments shortly. You've got to get your. Uh, don't stand between people and refreshments, you'll get killed. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you your views of um, the issue of the visual recognition uh, in the Constitution, mm. whether, um, whether that you see that being successfully prosecuted by this government or some government in the future as something that's a, an enabler of. Well, it's it's not a hindrance. It's um, it's not necessarily an enabler. Too. Uh, what what it really is about is is having uh, and this is a novel idea. It's not right science, you know. Uh, that if you're doing things for Indigenous people, then we want Indigenous people to be involved in that process. We want them to have leadership in that process. That's a pretty simple concept. For me, it's about rather than having a, a committee up here to Parliament, we need to, how do we get the people on the ground involved in that process and have them, because at the end of the day, they're the traditional owners of their country, they, they, would, they would like to have a voice into what happens on their country. They would like to be able to say yes or no or whatever in regard to that. And, and so that was my thing, you know, that up here, We've tried that before, it's failed. It's more about how do we get people on the ground in each of these uh, traditional owner communities and that to have that voice into that process. And that's the important part to me. Because yeah. they speak for country. I don't speak for their country. They do. Thanks, Brian. Okay, thank you. You might be interested to know that majority of those YouTubing have got thumbs up and no one has thumbs down, so I suppose that means it's and good. I want the phone numbers of people saying he's a very handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'd li now I'd like to ask Francis Gonzaga, the President of the Students' Activities Committee, to move a vote of thanks on our behalf. Firstly, thank you, Warren, for taking the time to come to Warren College um, and temporarily rebranding it to the Warren Lecture. Um, one thing that I took away from one thing that I took away from this talk was you said in 1967 the 1967 referendum didn't give you the right to vote, but you've actually always had the right to vote from the very start. And I think only recently I've only realised how important the right to vote really is. Um, just today, a couple of Warren residents and new college residents receive leadership positions on the Student Representative Council at UNSW. But this wouldn't have been possible if college residents didn't realise that they had the right to vote. And having that right to vote, as you said, comes with having a quality education. So I hope that we can continue to ramp up our efforts to not only invest in these disadvantaged Aboriginal communities' welfare payments, but equalising it with a quality education so that they can bridge the gap economically and also politically. So on behalf of the college, we have our first year, Ryan Stooley, offering you Warren cufflinks and also our college tumbler and tie as a token of our appreciation. And they've told me you're changing the name of the school to Warren College, isn't it? Something like that? That concludes the formal part of the proceedings. We've now got refreshments in the main dining room on the other side of the foyer. Uh, people who are streaming from home, you can indulge in whatever you like. We do appreciate your streaming in and appreciate those who've come here physically. So, good night. Thanks, Warren. Thank you. That, that answered a lot of questions I've formulated in my mind. Okay. Do you have an electronic version?